we are recording, so I'd like to say welcome. As you already may be gathered, or you can see at the bottom, my name is Fred Zerm. That is not a nom de plume, that is my name. Um, I represent the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. We used to be called the Chautauqua Literary Arts Friends, but we decided to focus on what our main mission is, which is supplementing and supporting the activities of the Institution's Writers Center. The Institution brings usually two writers per week um, to teach workshops, uh, give a joint reading, and also individual lectures on prose or poetry. So we try to support and supplement that with things like the Author's Hour. Um, I'll get into the other things we do at halftime between the writers. Just a few ground rules. If you're in a noisy environment or you are a noisy person, you might want to mute yourself, especially as I'm going to shift to speaker view here because it's a better way to record. Okay, for instance, right now I might be getting someone who's making some noise. So mute yourself if you think that you might make noise and suddenly you're going to become the biggest face on the screen or name on the screen. Um, I also, and actually my two co-hosts, have the ability, if we can find you, to what I say, either mute you if you're making too much noise, unintentional, I'm sure, or boot you uh, <laughs> if you are a Zoom bomber in our midst, okay? So, yeah, lots of you have your video off. That's your prerogative. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to say at this point. Let's get on with the show. Uh, as I said, there will be Q&A at the end. Each of the authors have approximately 20 minutes to read from their work. Uh, our first author is Dr. Shahed Aziz. In his book, he'll teach you how to learn how to talk to patients and their caregivers about end of life decisions from a man who has done it over a thousand times in the last 20 years. Dr. Aziz is board certified in pediatrics medical management, and hospice and palliative medicine. After training in pediatrics at University of Maryland, he has been on the clinical faculty of the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins, along with- Oh, okay, here's Fred, honey. Okay, we need, please mute yourself if you think you're in a noisy environment. I just heard someone, okay? Johns Hopkins, along with multiple local hospitals in, Bal in the Baltimore metropolitan area. He chairs multiple ethics committees and works with palliative care teams at local hospitals and hospices, helping take care of children and adults. He is actively involved in the education of the public and medical personnel. Dr. Aziz has simplified the end-of-life decision process as a result of his active problem-solving and crisis intervention for the terminally ill. Adults, along with children and their parents, benefit from his thorough, sufficient, succinct, and simple approach. His mindful attention to personal needs, cultural and religious backgrounds, and family dynamics have produced an approach that is most beneficial to all concerned. Understanding his model and following this thoughtful and thorough process will give you confidence and your patients, if you're a professional, their loved ones, peace of mind. So you'll, I'll say, listen on. It says read on here, but let's listen on and learn more about courageous con conversations on dying. Dr. Aziz, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, very good to meet you all. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Fred, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this and uh, being one of the two speakers of talking about a nonfiction book. So, um, uh, by the way, this is what the book looks like in case you're looking for it, but if you're in Chautauqua, you can get it at the bookstore, otherwise 
on Amazon. There as, as you and uh, and, and uh, Fred's going to give you the information at the end of the talk uh, of the full name of the book, uh, Courageous Conversations on Dying, uh, The Gift of Palliative Care and How to Get It. So uh, I'm a pediatrician and uh, how did I get into all of this? So very briefly, at one point in my life, I was a chair of the ethics committee and also medical director of a hospital. And I saw a lot of pain and suffering of the patients who were severely sick and near the end of life. And I started to think about and work with as to what to do, how to change my career as essentially, so that I just only work now with the patients who are near the end of life. And what I uh, realized and uh, is now becoming more and more clear to everybody and uh, especially with the COVID, people are now even more interested and realize that advanced care planning is the key to decreasing suffering at the end of life for all concerned. Every time we have a patient with severe problems, the question comes up, what does the patient want? What is his wishes? And in the majority of them, nobody has ever had those conversations and no advanced care planning. So we're going to talk about uh, how to do that uh, very simply. And I'm just going to read some portions from my book to give you an idea of what the book has to offer. So this book is a practical guide for physicians and healthcare workers on how to have conversations on death and dying and reading end of life issues. And also a very helpful book to patients and general public. So it can be used by everybody. This includes not only holding caring conversations when one is faced with giving bad news, but also having those initial and ongoing conversations that guide and support patients and families in preparing for the end of life and its management. This can ensure a meaningful life and a good death for the patient and peace for the families. This involves advanced care planning, not just for the ill, but also as part of anticipatory guidance for the well. We all deserve a wonderful life and one enriched with family, friends, and the ability to live according to our own hopes, wishes, and desires. This can also include a good, dignified, and peaceful death. Death is a part of everyone's life, and a good death can be a very real part of anyone's life, but it takes timely and focused planning in advance. So my book has multiple chapters, uh, the, and, uh, but they're short. They're about 30 odd chapters, but they're only three, four pages. It's very easy to read, easy to understand. This, uh, now I want to move on to the chapter called The Gift. And I'd like to read a little bit from that. This process of advanced care planning allows patients to articulate their goals and drives the plan of care to determine what treatments to offer in order to achieve these goals. Thus holding these conversations is the gift that the palliative care team consisting of physicians, nurses, social workers, nurse practitioners, chaplains, and more offers to the patient, the family, and other healthcare providers, and all those who support the patient with focus on all aspects of suffering, physical, emotional, psychosocial, and spiritual. This work completed by the palliative care team becomes the gift to other clinicians who do not have the time or the ex expertise to engage in this difficult task. It is also a gift to the patient because having had the talk about the future goals, the remainder of his or her life will be lived in a manner that makes the most sense. Conversations about death and dying and advanced care planning that clearly define one's important goals and wishes is a gift to one's family. Probably one of the best gifts one can give to one's children and loved ones. The family can now be guided by these wishes if the capacity for decision-making is lost and one or more members of the family must make decisions at this emotional time. Decisions can now be based on what is known to be important to the loved one. This reduces the burden to the family since plan of care is now based on the patient's voiced wishes, 
values and goals, the family can be at peace that the decisions, they can be at peace with the decisions knowing they are making the right decisions as well as honoring their loved one's wishes. So when a patient's wishes are not known, our helping the family make the hard choices that alleviate suffering is a gift from us to the family and from the family to the dying patient. As stated by one of my patient's family members, the sister of a 53-year-old lady with terminal stages of CP, she said, letting our sister die in peace now is a gift from us to her. Letting go is a major act of love and a gift. So you can see this coming Christmas, what gift you have to give to your families is the conversation. With or without the book, you have the conversation. Anyway, so uh, let me go on to another chap part of another chapter now. And this, is, this chapter is called Realistic Hope. One detail that separates the palliative care physicians, like myself, from other specialties in medicine is that we are charged with giving our patients hope that is realistic without being defeatist. We can help our patients to understand the true nature of their disease progression by beginning with quotes, realistic, uh, what we say is realistically, I would expect the following, and then we give them the details. And then we end with questions to the patient like, what are you hoping for? What are your fears? What are your desired results? And what is the meaningful to you at a minimum? This later stage of disease management is often mistakenly thought to be the point when all are giving up hope. But I believe this type of thinking is quite misdirected. We must understand that hope during a terminal disease is not a linear progression from cure to death. Hope changes as time and disease march on. What begins as a hope for a mistaken diagnosis becomes the hope for a miracle from a second opinion. Then it becomes hope for a cure, then hope for another remission, then hope for a little more time, followed by hope for a little less pain, and finally hope to end suffering. Hope for another year, a month, a week, a day, or even an hour of good time spent together is hope that is worthwhile. I found this beautifully illustrated by the father of one of my patients. As you remember, I do pediatric hospice too. So uh, his 16 year old daughter was actively dying of brain cancer and was in a comatose state. During my home visit, he confided in me that he hoped for just one more moment of looking in her eyes like he had done the day before. This father said, you know, doc, yesterday she opened her eyes so I just lay in bed with her and gazed into her eyes for a good 45 minutes. That was the best day. Now I'm just hoping for one more moment like that again. I'm going to move to another chapter. Did I do something? <laughs> no, no. Um, I'm innocent. <laughs> okay. That's the thing about those env external environments. They just sometimes rain okay. noise on us. <laughs> All right. So we, we owe it to ourselves and our families to have our end of life conversations with our loved ones. And as physicians, we owe it to our patients to address their end of life living goals by means of advanced care planning in a timely fashion while they still have decision-making capacity. But when is a good time to do this? The time to do the dialogue is now. While we have, your patients still have their wits and while you have your wits, whether they have a serious illness or not. As physicians, it is our responsibility to help establish clear goals of care, which will then guide the plan of care. 
for the patient. The goal is to maintain the patient at the minimum acceptable level of, of functioning or better. Finding out what that the patient envisioned that life to be can be achieved by asking the three questions. So now we're going to talk about the three questions, which is the nitty gritty of how to do this in a, in a, in a simple manner. So if we could establish the minimum level of meaningful life for the doctor, the, the, for you, the doctors and hospitals would know when aggressive treatments are not warranted and when just keeping you comfortable would be the best thing to do, just as you had chosen. So let's talk about that. It may sound complicated, but it's not. This can be accomplished by simply answering the following three questions to establish what kind of a life is worth living for you. Question one, what is the minimum level of mental functioning or mental awareness level that is acceptable to you with the help of life prolonging treatments, whether they be medicines, machines, or artificially provided food and water by tubes or IVs? Second question, what is the minimum level of physical functioning that is acceptable to you with the help of life prolonging treatments? And the third question is, what if any life prolonging treatments are acceptable to you or acceptable for a period of time to see if we can get you to your minimum acceptable level of function? And are there any known treatments you're opposed to? And if so, why? Most areas of concern for everyone have to do with independence, mobility, ability to bathe, toilet, eat, and communicate. So these three simple questions can help patients achieve more control at the end of life, even when they have lost the ability to make their own healthcare decisions. These questions are basically the same whether the patient is relatively ill or well, and the details of types of therapies may change some depending upon their specific disease. All you're trying to do is establish the minimum goals when life is being prolonged by artificial uh, means, again, medicine, machines, or nutrition. So you can see how those, that it can be simply done. And then if you have that conversation, your families would know what is important to you. So I'm gonna give you an example of, if you have these conversations, what the document might look like, what or what your, your conversation with your family may look like. So here's an example of end of life goals for Mrs. JJ. So JJ was 78 years old with a long history of diabetes and COPD, now complicated by repeated hospitalizations over the last two years, along with heart failure. She was on continuous oxygen at home, able to get around with difficulty. She still had her capacity and enjoyed her meals. So when we talked to her, her end of life wishes and living goals were as follows. Number one, I do not want my life prolonged by any means if I'm unable to communicate with my family, verbally or by gestures, even though I may be able to recognize that. So that's her minimum level that she wants her mental function to be at, at least or better. Number two, if I cannot get out of bed myself, please let me die in peace. Do not extend my life by artificial means. Number three, always make sure I'm pain free and not suffering. Number four, I do not want to be resuscitated if my heart or breathing stops. And I do not want to be tube fed if I cannot enjoy food by mouth. And that's it. So this is like one page, six, and very simple and uh, straightforward and easy to understand. So if everybody did that, uh, treatments at the end of life would be much easier. Anyway, I wanted to share another story where having the conversation or not having the conversation had made a difference to this person. So the, this is uh, titled 30 Years of Suffering. My wife and I were traveling in the beautiful town of San Miguel Allende in Mexico and we were on a city bus tour. 
Next to me sat a gentleman from the US and in chatting about life um, and careers, I told him about my hospice and palliative care work and what it entailed. So after about a two hour ride in the bus, when we got out, he kept waiting for all of us to alight before they finally got out and said he wished to talk to me. He asked, in your work that you do, you must have had to decide or help families decide and then stop life-sustaining treatments. Oh yes, this comes up all the time, I said. Then how do you do it and what do you say? You see, I had to decide about stopping life support on my wife 30 years ago and after she had been in a car accident. And to this day, I wonder if I did the right thing. We had a long discussion then and I reaffirmed that he did do the right thing since nothing good and meaningful would, could come out of continued life support after weeks of trial. Letting his wife go was a big act of love, not to force her to suffer for his sake. Although it was sad and hard, it was the right thing for her. Prolonging a meaningless existence cannot be ethically justified. He had definitely done the right thing. I emphasized a caring act for someone he loved dearly. His eyes teared up as did mine and we hugged. He thanked me profusely and said, you know, this has troubled me for 30 years. Thank you for helping me see that it was right. Wow, what a burden he has carried for so long, even when he had made the right choice. This again affirmed my belief that my, any little thing that we can do to take the burden off the shoulders of the family is a gift to them. Even when they make the decisions, we need to affirm that their decision is right use kind, caring, supporting words and explanations so they will be at peace with it. So um, if he and his wife had had this conversation by some chance, talking about, hey, if you were in an accident or things happen, uh, what would be important to you? If they'd had this conversation, he would not have suffered because he would have done what his wife would have wished. And this is with the COVID has actually brought us Everybody wants to have this discussion now because know that the COVID, uh, you can lose your uh, ability to make decisions in a hurry. Okay, so uh, next I'm gonna, gonna talk, uh, this is a, from a chapter on the book on helping surrogates make decisions. And I'd like to share this story with you. One of my favorite stories, it is uh, uh, titled, uh, I do not want to lie in a bed of affliction. So this is a true story, actually all the stories are true in the book. It's a true story which illustrates the fact that just a simple comment in conversation can be helpful with difficult decisions later in life, even when there is no written advance directive or a living will. Also it points, the important point that the important thing is the conversation. So Mary was 93 years old with mild dementia. She could, you know, she could let you know how she was feeling but could not make much sense otherwise and could not make her own decisions. She had mild contractures of her legs and lay in bed most of the time but could get up with help. Mary was admitted with a painful left foot, gangrene of her toes and sepsis. She was being treated with antibiotics and doctors recommended amputation of her leg below the knee to get rid of the gangrene and save her life. Her family was asked for a consent and her family members then met with the palliative care team and myself to discuss opinion options and see what would be the right choice. There were no written advance directives from the uh, mother. In further talking with Mary's family, about the kind of life they thought she would have wanted to live. One of the sons remembered her saying, I never want to lie in a bed of affliction. The family was asked to keep this comment of hers in mind going forward and to make decisions that would honor her wish of not lying in a bed of affliction. 
With the help of this comment and the guidance of the palliative care team, they were able to decide not to have the surgery because although that would give her a longer life, she would definitely be lying in a bed of affliction. They opted to enroll her in hospice instead and take her home to be with the family for as long as God wished her to be there. The family was at peace with their decision since they felt it followed Mary's voiced wishes. So you can see how just a little comment that somebody made because they had this conversation helped the family to be at peace and make the decision. Without that, heaven knows what may have happened. Okay, so please encourage your families, your patients to start having these talks about living and dying, what kind of life is acceptable to them and what is not. Even a casual remark about their preferences can wind up being very helpful. The key factor again, and the beauty is in having the talks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank is you. it my time up or? Yes, your time, your time is up. But thank you, you hit it right on the dot there, right on the dot. I, I did, okay, you then I- You can either unmute so you can do applause. All right, okay, you thank you so much. Thank you. Like this, <laughs> or like that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thanks a lot. Um, let me, well, actually, excuse my, I'm going to try to share some information in case just um, hearing it wasn't enough. Hmm. Did the right thing come on? I'm not getting anything on my screen. No. Um, Let me stop and try again. I'm seeing your desktop, I think, is what I'm seeing. Okay. It's a nice desktop, isn't it? It's, it's, <laughs> it looks so nice and clean. Yeah. Okay. I think I didn't. <laughs> nice quite... and tidy. Here we go. Just like Justin's closet. Right. No skeletons here. There it is. <laughs> okay. So two ways to get the book at the Chautauqua Bookstore either online or in person, I believe, or on Amazon. I don't have the exact link, but if you search the title, there is also a blog that Dr. Aziz maintains. So one way or another. Also, theoretically, at least, if you look at the top of chat, um, you should find some information about Dr. Aziz's books and also our next reader. However, this is halftime, so I'm going to share a little bit more about the Friends of the Chautauqua Writers Center. And hopefully this will come on. Maureen, you're my checker. Did, did yes, it's all okay. good. Great, great. So our weekly events. Sunday at five o'clock is an open mic. And until we're overwhelmed with numbers, it'll continue to be a truly open mic. No sign up ahead of time. If you go to the website down here, www.chq.org slash FCWC, you can find a link to a link so that you can join that on Zoom if you're so inclined, either as a reader or as a listener. Um, the author's hour you're at now, um, until we have to change it, the link is the same every week. Next week, we have Susan Nussbaum, a very established poet. I believe she has three books out. Was uh, one, of the, one of our prize examples of a Writer's Center student who went on to uh, great things. And Phil Terman, uh, who was very often a teacher at the Writer's Center and one of the founders of the Writers Festival at Chautauqua. He's a very well-respected poet. They'll be reading next week. Um, special events to think about. 
And since we're sort of Chautauqua without walls, without boundaries is here. If, you're, if you've attended a Chautauqua event online, you're a Chautauquan. If you have a favorite poem, something that means a lot to you personally that you did not write and a family member did not write, a published poem, um, you can apply to read that poem on Wednesday, July 29th at five o'clock in another Zoom meeting. If you go to that website again, you can find an application. Applications are due by a week before July 22nd. And if you are a writer, there are writing contests for all age levels with some cash prizes, some other just uh, physical prizes for the younger writers, um, and a category of flash fiction as well. Once again, you can go to that website. You can find um, application for the writing contest. If you join the Friends, you don't have to pay the $5 reading fee. You'll also get a discount, and I'm presently negotiating how much of a discount on Chautauqua, the literary arts journal of the institution. If you have questions, you can use our email, friends of the Writers Center at gmail.com, and I'll do my best to answer your questions or find someone who can answer questions. And we're getting some late admissions here. Okay. <laughs> now, please mute yourself when you enter if you're in a noisy environment because. What happens is you end up prime focus on the screen. But let's get to our next reader. Maureen Ryan Griffin has been a special studies instructor here at Chautauqua, has taught the art and craft of writing over 30 years through a wide variety of venues. An award-winning poet and nonfiction writer, she's published in Calix, Chelsea, Cincinnati Poetry Review, The Texas Review, and the Chautauquan Daily, among others. Her books include Spinning Words into Gold, A Hands-On Guide to the Craft of Writing, How Do I Say Goodbye, A Companion in Grieving, Healing, and Gratitude, and her latest collection of poetry, 10,000 Cicadas Can't Be Wrong. And you're currently working on a memoir, I believe. Is that true? Yes, yes, I am. A cookbook memoir. <laughs> oh, that's a Interesting it's, it's a new genre that I made up. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be one of the leading lights in the cookbook memoir. <laughs> no. What was that? Julie Julia, the movie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit like that. Maureen offers individual coaching as well as writing classes through her business, Wordplay, at www.wordplaynow.com. She's also a great friend and a great editor who has helped me get a chapbook accepted for publication. So thank you, Maureen. Maureen Ryan Griffin, take it away. Thank you, Fred. And thank you so much for gathering us together here. And I um, also thank Shahid. We've had a, a long friendship his, uh, through his wife, Jean, who took a class with me, my first class I ever taught through special studies at Chautauqua. And I really want to thank all of you who are here, a lot of my, my uh, students and friends and uh, fellow Chautauquans. I, I'm so grateful that, that you could join us. And I wish we could be all sitting on the porch. Uh, I'm, I'm a poser in front of uh, the, the building that Fred's actually <laughs> sitting on the porch of, uh, where we would be having this reading. But then if I were on the porch reading, you all wouldn't, many of you wouldn't be here. So I'm, I'm excited about what this opens up. And I just wanna to say to all of you, because um, I, I am a great fan of your writing and so many of you, I know you're writing very well. And I, I just really encourage you to take advantage of some of the Writer Center um, opportunities. I will tell you that I learned about the Writers' Center at Chautauqua through the North Carolina Writers' Network newsletter when, when uh, my son Dan was 
was I think one and a half and, and Amanda was, was four or five. And I thought, oh my gosh, mother in Erie, 30 miles away to babysit children while I take a writing class. And that's what I did. And um, I, I hope you will check out the Writers in Residence. They have a poetry workshop every morning and a, and a prose workshop every afternoon with really top-notch people. And I can't tell you when I look through, this is um, 10,000, oh, I, I'm screen sharing, so it doesn't come out for well. Anyway, 10,000 skaters can't be wrong. And so many of these poems, um, I, I started in, in, um, in the Chautauqua writing classes. So I, I'm just excited that, that you all can take advantage of that this summer. And I, I thought that um, I would, would start off, and in my typical way, um, I had a whole big lineup all planned, and I'm, I'm going to go completely off script. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's it's it's just more more alive that way. Um, and and I thought uh, looking at the Chautauqua porch about another place I really love the Chautauqua bookstore. And I thought I would read this poem uh, that uh, that mentions the Chautauqua bookstore. And it, it's called "The Only Way I Can Find to Tell You How Good I Feel Today Is to Talk About Dandelions." And it's a prose poem and it winds its way through through a number of different memories and experiences so hold on because we're going for a ride and and I wrote this poem when um, my mother uh, had had um, been exhibiting many signs of dementia and things that she once be able once was able to do very easily she uh, could no longer do and uh, I, I was raising children myself. It was a crazy time. And I had such a mix of emotions. And I think this is one of the great gifts that writing gives us. Um, and especially now in the middle of a pandemic, um, when, when we're feeling a whole big mix of emotions, it's so wonderful to have a place to put that and, and to create something out of it. So here comes the only way I can find to tell you how good I feel today is to talk about dandelions. This joy is incongruous. My 10th grade geometry taught me that much. Circumstances and happiness, mismatching angles in any proof, no matter how I turn the protractor. Our van and microwave and repair shops, racking up bills we can't afford, and yesterday the vacuum hiccuped to a stop halfway up the stairs, leaving a litter of dirt and crumbs I can't sweep away. Worse, a phone call detailing seven hours of surgery to remove three quarters of a friend's mother's tongue. Plans for a feeding tube directly into the stomach while my children quibble over whose doll weighs more. Really, my own mother, whose memory is beginning to fail, called three times, panicked about recipes she can't find. I reassured her I have them, will send them, wondering why she wants them, why I should bother when she admitted she has trouble following them and most of the time, they don't turn out. Just let go, mother, I wanted to tell her. But I promised you dandelions, and today, not mothers and yesterday. And I haven't forgotten how I let sunrise and birdsong tempt me into a walk before breakfast, a walk on which, after 14 years in this suburban neighborhood, I see something I've never seen before, a weathered barn nestled into a plot of land just a few blocks away. The woman who lives next door knows nothing about it. I'm not sure she's ever noticed it. And walking home, I look down and see a dandelion wet with dew that makes each tiny seed pod parachute distinct which makes this dandelion look different from the fuzzy fluffs you see all over this time of year, which reminds me of the time my husband and I drove by someone's yard 
and the profuse scatters of yellow were so vivid, so eye-catching, that he asked me what they were. When I told him dandelions, he didn't believe me. Dandelions, he said, are those white puffy things kid blo kids blow. I laughed at a grown man, not recognizing a life stage of something as ordinary, as ubiquitous as a dandelion. Which reminds me of the time I stood in the Chautauqua bookstore, reading a Zen koan about a traveler who went from house to house in a village, looking for a place to spend the night, turned away repeatedly, like the pregnant Mary, he slept under a pear tree at the outskirts of town, woke in the night to the sight of moonlight through pear blossoms, the most beautiful sight of his life. So lovely. He returned the next morning to every household that refused him, thanking them for their great gift. All this in one dandelion that I pick and carry home up the still dirty stairs to my study where I go online to look up dandelion photographs. I can't say why, except that I love those spunky suns that spin to downy stars, ride the wind to take root in a new home and being reminded of the koan and that whatever angles are congruent or incongruent, whatever curves are tossed our way, the world will always be full of things to see for the first time. Indeed, I find 92 pictures of dandelions in many life stages, the one from a 1921 book called Wild Flowers of New York, my favorite, because I never believed for a moment that a dandelion is a weed. Do you see how I see this morning that I don't need anything in my life to work the way I want it to? Not the van, not the microwave, not the vacuum, not even my mother, though I think I finally understand how much I love her. So I haven't, uh, I haven't read that for, for a long time. And I still remember standing in that bookstore and, and reading that, that story. Um, speaking of, of my, my mother, um, and I, I, um, never imagined when I was growing up that I would that I would spend so much of my writing life writing about her. Um, but that is indeed what happened. I had, um, she, she brought me my joy and delight in writing because she read me so many wonderful stories. And she also um, gave me the gift of turning to writing for healing because she struggled so much with depression and anxiety. And that was was often very difficult. And it took me a long time to to realize that that was a gift. And uh, we became very close when I, when I grew up. And after I lost her, I created the two grief rituals that, that Fred mentioned. Uh, one of them has, oh, I can't really, I'll be showing you later. One of them uh, has, has um, scripture passages and the other has quotes. But I thought I would read you a little piece uh, in here. The, it, this, this has uh, really, it walks, walks um, through the, the process of saying goodbye to someone all the way from regret through reconciliation and on to treasuring with steps in between and photographs and room for readers to write. And I call it a, um, a companion in grieving, healing, and gratitude because that's what it was for me. And I'm just going to read you the introduction to the reconciliation step. Um, and there's a quote from Genesis 45, 14. Then he, and this is Joseph, threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and Benjamin embraced him, weeping. Just as our loved ones have wronged us sometimes, we have at times hurt, angered, 
and disappointed our loved ones. If there is anything that you regret having said or done, you can now ask your loved ones forgiveness and experience reconciliation. It's time to let go of any guilt and shame you may be harboring. When I did this ritual, I wrote, Mother, please forgive me for not realizing how happy a letter or phone call would have made you. I ask your forgiveness for not appreciating how hard you work to raise four children born within five years of each other. Imagine your loved one's arms around you, embracing you with forgiveness, just as in the passage above, Joseph embraced his brother Benjamin. Let yourself experience the peace that flows from this moment of reconciliation. And I can honestly say, and, and Fred mentioned that I, um, my memoir that I'm writing, which is a cookbook memoir because my mother loved to cook, uh, really kind of lived to cook. She was a dietitian by trade, and I'm a writer who doesn't even like to cook. But I found this wonderful intersection uh, between, between story and food that, uh, that I have just found um, to be such a rich vein. And I can honestly say that having moved through this grief ritual uh, numerous times and all of the writing I've done about my mom that I feel closer to her than, than I, I did when she was alive in, in many moments, which I think is one of the, the great um, uh, gifts of, of allowing ourselves to grieve, allowing ourselves to move through the process of saying goodbye. And I, I've had people um, in my life who have actually used this ritual before they lost their loved one. So one of my students is actually doing that now and she told me how, how wonderful it felt to be getting out all these regrets and resentments and anger and, and fear because she wants to give her mother the best possible death she can and be there for her brother who she knows is gonna be devastated. But the process goes goes on and, um, and I think this time of pandemic is just reminding us so much that we are mortal. And, um, and I love the work that, that Shahid does in his book to help us to talk about these things. And I, I wanted to share with you um, a little poem. I, I always read something by another writer I, and I see my writing teacher uh, beaming at me. Hello, Irene. <laughs> Um, she's the one who introduced me to this poem, uh, and if you read my zine you, and you saw it yesterday, you'll have already heard this, but this is a poem uh, by Raymond Carver called Late Fragment, and, um, and I won't go into the whole story of how it, it showed up in my life very recently, again, uh, in a very beautiful synchronistic way, but I will read it for you. Uh, this was the last poem in the last book that Raymond, Raymond Carver wrote in his book, A New Path to the Waterfall. And it's a, it's a conversation, a very short one called Late Fragment. And did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. How I love that poem. And I realized yesterday as I was putting together the zine, um, it, it suddenly hit me in a way that it was so obvious. You know, my grandkids watch Captain Obvious and this is a very much a Captain Obvious kind of a thing that, that um, there's my five minutes, um, that, that, that's really, I think, what every one of us wants. Every one of us really wants to call ourselves beloved, to, to know ourselves beloved on this earth. And um, I think in this time of pandemic, uh, just walking around with that knowledge uh, is, is such a comfort to me because no matter what else is swirling on around me, I always have that opportunity to, to uh, see if I can help someone else to, to feel how beloved they are to me, for example. Um, so I, I wanted to, to share that with you. And um, I think I, um, I'm gonna share in my last couple minutes, I uh, want to share a little poem that I wrote for my daughter. It's called uh, Deep End. And 
this is a, a was a celebration for me because it's about uh, I wrote it when my daughter took her first swimming lessons, and uh, she just took her two year old daughter Ellie for a very appropriately socially distanced and safe mom and and toddler swim. And I thought, wow, what what goes around really does come around. And I think it mirrors so perfectly the 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 war within me between between fear and trust that that I'm experiencing in the times that we're living in now. It's called Deep End. Even her hair floats. She's learned the exact angle of chin, elbow to keep her eyes open. She knows the tricks to think. As long as you're on top, it doesn't matter where the bottom is. I watch my daughter, limbs spread on the water, trusting it will hold her. And I am I'm going to um, close with um, another little piece from my grief ritual. Um, this is uh, my, uh, my uh, piece on, on gratitude. And I, um, this, this was my sign uh, in, in this moment, right near my mother, the end of my mother's life, um, both that, that there was spirit working in the midst of all this, and also that I really did uh, at the end of my life, give my mother a sense of her, of her being beloved. I didn't know where to begin capturing even a fraction of my gratitude for my mother's presence in my life. But as I sat next to a peaceful stream, and I created this ritual and, and did it for my mom the first time at a retreat center called Well of Mercy, that's the stream I'm referring to, as I sat next to that stream, I remembered an October afternoon, about six months before she died from the Lewy body disease, which robbed her of her physical abilities and her lucidity, except for occasional glimmers in brief moments. After feeding her lunch, I'd held her hands. In that moment of simply being with her, deep gratitude welled up in me. It was such a precious time, as hard as it was, witnessing her let go of so much with such grace and courage. I couldn't have imagined that just sitting in a patch of sunshine, holding my mother's hands and smiling into her eyes could make me feel so happy. And gift of all gifts, in that moment, out of her silence, my mother spoke these words. I'm so grateful. So, and I am, am so very grateful again to each of you for being here. I, I wish you um, many good hours of writing and I hope I will see you again and maybe even in a Chautauqua class sometime. Thanks again. And thank you again, Fred, for, for hosting us and making this all possible. You're welcome. You're very welcome. As you can unmute and cheer if you want, or put up an icon, <laughs> or just gesticulate if you're on video. <laughs> um, yeah, we are hearing some. Yay! It's nice to hear some applause. Okay, great. Now, if you would like to ask a question, we have two ways of doing it. One, you can go on chat and ask a question either for Maureen or Shahed. Um, or if you go to participants and you want to orally ask a question, click participants, there should be a, on the left, I believe it is, a way to raise a hand. And I will try to keep track of anything that comes in on chat. And um, Maureen and Shahed can help me do that because they have access to chat. And I will yes. and I will also see if any hands get raised under participants for people who want to ask a question orally. 
I just have yes, a, and Fred, I actually want to go ahead and share on the screen for a second. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I just you about forgot that. about this, but if oh, any of you are so interested, I. Uh, yes, I. That's a. That's a. Just the way it all rolls. Um, but if if any of you are interested in finding out more about the classes that I offer or these books, I'll just leave that up for a little while, and we'll carry on with our our good conversation. I just have a comment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, uh, Maureen, you chose uh, to talk about the dandelion because that, that's, the, that's the, what I chose All right. to be on the top of my book. It's not the end, but you're going someplace higher and better. Uh, oh, Shahid, Shah, that is an amazing synchronicity. I forgot that you had a dandelion on the cover. That is quite remarkable. That's, a, that's grace. Thank you. <laughs> I guess there are no questions. I am not finding any yet. So you either raise your hand under participant, especially if you want to do it orally, or you can write something on chat. I'm not seeing anything yet. Or you can unmute yourself and blurt out if you want. <laughs> okay. Can you hear not. me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm hearing yes. somebody. It's Irene, and I cannot get y'all back on. That's why I wondered. I don't know what happened. Um, I can't see any. Well, I can see two people. Well, why don't, uh, uh, Maureen, why don't you stop screen sharing and see? Oh, if, yes, absolutely. Let me do okay. that, and that'll probably help. Does that help, Irene? I can't see you. Um, well, if, there's, if, you look in the, if you look in the upper right corner, there, yeah. There's an opportunity to enter full. Uh, you you can you can click on that. There's a little circle, and you should be able to um, click and see everybody who's on here. You can you can click and and um, what you I might saw, be. Yeah, I saw everybody earlier, and then something. Oh, happened. Irene, Irene, if you can start your video, I think if you start your video, that might that'll help. Okay, because I'm on my tablet. Start video. Oh, now yeah, I can see. The, all right. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. That was Kelly Great. in the chat. Sorry. I love we have smart people with us. <laughs> so we're supposed to ask, this is the chance to ask a question, right? Uh, right. Yes. yes. Uh, well, I'm sorry I had, uh oh, now there's a shirt. No, somebody's walking. Oh, that's Elaine. Uh, and now I can't see, I can't, see, now I see you, but I don't see Maureen. But anyway, I'll ask a question. Let me yeah, think I'm of here. One. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Um, gee, I don't know what to ask now, but I want to, uh, I'll go with, uh, yeah, could you talk a little more, uh, could you talk a little more about, can you, can you hear me? Yes. yes uh, could you talk a little more about Raymond Carver? What, did he influence your poetry or? Did, have you already said that? Because she, I'm she's, sorry. She's kind of, she's kind of a plant, Irene, because, um, she, she she is my beloved writing teacher, um, and I, I think I will just I will just tell you all that I I met Irene because of my very good friend Gilda Marina Syverson. You should wave at everybody, Gilda. Um, and and I I just oh and there's my there's Shahid's lovely wife Jean. Hello Jean. Um, and hello to all of you I'm, uh, that, uh, that I'm not seeing or saying hello to. I'm I'm just grateful for each of you here. But I'm I'm calling out a couple people, Jean, because. Um, she introduced me to Shahid and she was in the first special studies class at Chautauqua I ever taught and we've been fast friends ever since and Gilda I met in a, a children's writing class I took and she uh, has been my, my was my first writing friend in the writing community in Charlotte and we still uh, get together often to critique each other's work uh, which is which is a great joy and and Gilda kept telling me you need to take a class with Irene so I took a class with Irene and, and it scared the bejesus out of me, as some people like to say, um, because she introduced us to this book called Writing Down the Bones, and she would read us something wonderful, including Raymond Carver. Raymond Carver came in to, to some of those readings, and then she would tell us, she set a timer, and she'd tell us we had to just write whatever came, and then we read them out loud. And I, I have never been so terrified and excited in my life as during that class, because it was terrifying to not even know what I would say, and then to share it. And I was in a class with three professional writers who read for the Charlotte Observer and 
their writing, my writing compared to theirs, well, the, I can't even begin to compare them. I, I don't write that beautifully out of the gate, I will tell you. And, but, but this other part of me that wasn't terrorized was so excited to think that you could do this for a living. You could read people, beautiful, evocative, um, challenging pieces of writing, and, and then you could write and you could share with each other. And I just, it was, it was falling into heaven for me. And I really thank Irene. And when I think about Raymond Carver, I think about um, her retreats in the mountains where uh, we would hike and then we'd stop and write on the trail. And uh, she would read us Raymond Carver poems. And absolutely, Raymond Carver has, has um, taught me so much about poetry. I, I think uh, the great gift he gave me was um, really having, having poetry be a conversation. Um, yeah. I, I think um, he just has a very great gift with just dropping you right into his life. And it's a little like eavesdropping because he, like in Late Fragment, he's talking to someone, uh, I, I believe was his, his wife, uh, Tess Gallagher, who he was speaking to in that poem. But, but he was also speaking to everyone listening and I felt very spoken to. So I hope I did okay with that, I mean. You get an A. Yay, I get an A. Very great. <laughs> so does um, anybody else have something they want to share, a, a favorite writer who's influenced them, or a, or a question? Anybody have a question? We, we have one other question on chat. Oh, good. OK. Um, all right. I don't know if you're seeing it, but it's Jill Hammerin asks, first of all, thanks both you and Shahed for sharing your work. But ask Maureen, do you feel poetry can be taught? And if so, do you teach it? Sort of a oh, sideways smiley face. Okay. Thank you, Jill. Um, yes, I think poetry can be taught. And, and I actually have a, an online poetry course called Poetry Rocks. And it is 22, I think 22, maybe 23 lessons. And I take poetry into three components that I believe um, become braided together in poetry. I'm always looking for ways to figure out how amazing writers do what they do. And I'm always, you know, so one of the things I, I really thought about it, how, what makes a poem work, and of course I've got very good instruction from all the poets at Chautauqua that I studied from and all the uh, Irene and um, other many other poets that I had the fortune to work with, but I, the course is set up to, to talk about the content of a poem, the actual word choices, um, the, the subject matter, um, figurative language, all of, you know, just, just what's in the poem. And then the second strand is the sound of poetry because poetry started, started out as an oral tradition. And whether you're using formal rhythm or rhyme, just the way our words come together in terms of the, the repetition of sounds or the, the rhythm of the syllables, the way they fall, that's all part of the musicality. And then the last part, uh, because now we, we mostly encounter poems on the written page and, and is the form, the way that it's shaped on the page and how you can have the three of those things work together. So you can go to wordplaynow.com and, and you will find it there and, um, I, I hope you, you have a good time playing with it if that's what you decide to do. It's, I, I give a lot of examples uh, of how I wrote my own poems and some of the, the uh, different kinds of exercises that I've made up to, to make it fun. I call my business wordplay because I learned from my mother very early that language was delightful and you ought to be having a good time with it. Even if you're writing about something very difficult, that pleasure in language is still there. So thanks, Joe. Thank you. Uh, we have... Uh question about whether the books are available internationally. And okay, I think that so, can go to both of you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Shahid, why don't you start off telling Kelly about your book? Is your book available internationally? I think it is through yes. Amazon. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Amazon uh, UK or what I don't know what it's called, but uh, but yeah. I, I, I do get the information it, it was bought in Europe. Yeah, it is yeah. available on Amazon and everywhere. Right. Yeah, and, and Kelly, um, Poetry Rocks is actually an online course that gets delivered to your inbox and then there's a website with all the tools gathered and, um, and, and you can do that from anywhere. And then my two grief rituals are both available on Amazon and I know they, also, they can, can be purchased in the UK and a lot of other countries as well. 
10,000 cicadas, unfortunately, um, is not, but, but um, I, I think we could probably work out a deal. <laughs> so. good. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any more on chat. I do have a raised hand from Gilda. Gilda, uh, do you want to unmute yes. yourself okay. and ask a question? Go for it. All right, Maureen, I, I love you calling that a cookbook memoir because no one else has called that. You don't hear that anywhere. So it, it does really become uniquely yours and uh, your term. I mean, I know it's bigger than that, but I just, it, it, it lifted me when I heard that. So I yeah, just, thank you. Thank you. I, I think um, I, it is, it is such a, a big task and I don't know how many of the rest of you are, are working on a book length project. Um, and I, I think I will just share for those of you who are that, and I, I'm looking right at Jan, who, who was participating the last uh, two weeks in a conference called Writing for Your Life um, that was run by a, a gentleman named Brian Elaine, who um, actually is the person who, who took Frederick Beekner's beautiful work and made it available again for contemporary audiences and built his website and shared. And it was a wonderful conference and I, I learned so much. But I, I think my, my, if I had to pick one all time favorite, there's a writer named um, Elizabeth Jarrett Andrew has a book called Living Revision. And she speaks about the, the great joy and the great opportunity that, that the process of revision is. And she addresses our false beliefs about what revision is and opens us up to the possibility that revision is not just in our writing, but even in our lives. And it's, it's a wonderful book. So I, um, if any of you want to be revising and, and don't know where to get started or really don't like to revise or love to revise and would love to know to think more about the process in a, in a very uh, meaningful uh, new new way I highly recommend living revision so thanks Gilda okay um any last <laughs> cookbook with benefits for anybody <laughs> Mary <laughs> Stribble dear you made me laugh I'm sorry Fred I just saw the chat a cookbook with benefits, she says. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, all I want to all say right. is if anybody want, has a question or they want to talk to me, they're welcome to contact me. Uh, email is simple, askdraziz, askdraziz at gmail.com. Okay. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to converse you with know you. What? Shahid, if you if you tell me that again, I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and send it out to people. So it's okay. dr. Ask ask Doctor Aziz. A S K D R Aziz A Z I Z I Z at gmail dot com at gmail dot com, and I can tell you from personal experience that Shahid is just a lovely person to talk to about. Um, many, many different subjects and particularly this, this beautiful ministry of, of helping um, people on, on both sides, um, whether, whether you're the one who, who is, is facing end of life or someone you know is, really those conversations that, that bring so much love and, um, and compassion to the process. So thanks, thanks Shahid. Okay, thank you. Great, great. I um, think we'll wrap it up now. Thanks again to Dr. Aziz and to Maureen. Um, please, even if you don't know the people reading next week and you showed up this week because you knew someone, try showing up again. It's the, it'll be the same link. Two great poets, Susan Nussbaum and Phil Terman. Um, so please join the Friends activities and if possible, join the friends. Uh, your contribution helps us do the things we do. And if you haven't been to Chautauqua, look, I should have written this out too, but I didn't. Look at assembly.chq.org. There are at least two lectures every day by many um, widely known and some not widely known, but great lecturers. Um, thank Oops. you, Maureen, you're kind of- the, Well, except I put PRG instead. I, I misspelled it, so I don't know how helpful it was. 
<laughs> I'm trying again. Who knows what they'll find with that link, okay? But um, the assembly has occasional technical glitches because they're trying to hook up people from all over the world. But great stuff on something called the virtual porch. You get conversations, you get um, recitals, musical recitals, things like that. So you get a taste of what Chautauqua is about, even though Chautauqua is not currently functioning in its usual way. I don't know how many, I see some familiar faces have been to Chautauqua, but I don't know if you'll get any sense of the place at all, but I'm sitting on this porch of the building that Maureen has. And down the way, there's a Greek temple that's the Hall of Philosophy, where there's a lecture every afternoon. So, got a great lake, got two golf courses, uh, nice roads for biking, that's what I do, uh, kayaking on the lake. So, hook into Chautauqua if you haven't, and I hope to see you virtually the rest of this summer and in person, I hope, some future summer. Anyway, thanks again. I think we're going to call yeah. it today. If, thank uh, you, everybody. If Chai, if Chai All right. Had... Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. It's been wonderful to see you all and be with you. I appreciate yes, it yes. so much. Have a yes. great rest of the day. All right. Take care. If um, Shahed and Marina, if you want to stay for just a second for a debriefing, okay? Sure. Great. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Bye, Irene. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, John Boy. <laughs> bye, bye, John Boy. Okay. Bye. You guys. And Lola, it. thank you for being here. If you can hear me, I see you down I there. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of here so I can't be a spy. <laughs> yeah. in, in the I'm lower, in the lower so right can... corner, in the lower right corner, it should say "and." I believe. Irene, I'm, I'll go ahead. I'm going to remove it's you. Okay. Love really you. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Love you. I'm going to remove you. Well, <laughs> I might. Do the, well, I might uh, get rid of Jane. Come up, says Jane. Jane's ever gone. Oh, uh, Jane can stay. <laughs> she's she's family. <laughs> okay. Um, thought it worked out well. Um. Shahid, the timing worked out well. I wasn't sure you were seeing the messages I was yeah, sending you. I didn't, I didn't see the message. And you didn't see me turn into flying Fred. No, no. Okay. <laughs> I guess I was too... too <laughs> it, it worked out fine because I was about to thank you for your reading and you ended your reading. So that's, that's good. Okay. Anything, well, either now or email me anything about how this could be run better, or whatever. I think we got up to 26 or so participants, so 23 people not counting us. So good turnout, good turnout. That turnout was good, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. If uh, no further business, I'll adjourn the meeting. And thank you. Yeah, again. Fred, thank you so much. And yeah, one thing so that I, I would just recommend just in terms of, of future stuff um, is I think it would be awesome if you would just Ask the second reader, whoever that is, to take over enabling people in the waiting room. Um, because I, I just took that on myself. And I don't know if you saw people waiting to get in, but, what, well, um, I, think but I was on top of it. And then I just kept admitting, admitting, admitting. And then nobody had to wait. And you, you were talking. So, of course, it's pretty hard to be during admitting that time. people. You know. Yeah. During that time, thank you for doing that. Later, I was admitting people. So yeah, yeah I'll tell the co-hosts if, if they're not doing the actual reading, feel yeah, free to admit people that I might. That's why you the co-host. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was very. That was. I was really glad that you told us to do that and and set that up for us. It was helpful. Now I hope you didn't catch any of the extraneous or too much of the extraneous noise here. No, uh -huh. but, not at all. Good. I had no, um, some people carrying on a loud conversation around the corner, including some F-bombs. We couldn't, we couldn't hear that. Oh, I did not hear a thing. No, I did not hear one single F-bomb. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. Okay, that's a different form of Zoom bombing, okay? Anyway. Yes, absolutely, it is, it is. All right, well, Shahid, thank you. It was such thank a pleasure you. to be able to read with you. 
Same and here. Fred, Thank thanks again. again for everything. I'll be back to you either later today or tomorrow with the YouTube link. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Thanks so much to you.